If you'd like to support this program, become a Relax Your Grid superfan on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Dream, and you'll receive exclusive digital content plus a Relax Your Grid sticker. Thanks to all of you who support this show, including our newest supporter, Jake Sheps. Welcome to Relax Your Grid. I'm your host, Matt Brown. In this 12th episode of the podcast, I speak with Jake Sheps, director of the Banjo Summit. The Summit is a progressive three-finger banjo workshop for intermediate, advanced, and professional musicians. The next gathering will be held February 11th through 13th, 2022, on Zoom. It features an extraordinary cast of banjoists, including Kristen Scott Benson, Noam Pakelny, Bill Evans, Wes Corbett, and Jamie Stone. Jake and I also speak about his recent camp with the remarkable string band Hawktail, as well as his forthcoming series of highly anticipated banjo transcription books. Here's my conversation with Jake. Jake Sheps, welcome to Relax Your Grid. Thanks, great to be here. Good to see you. It's great to see you and hear you. We're recording this in January, and just last weekend, you put on this camp, a remote camp with the band Hawktail. So we're talking Brittany Haas, Dominic Leslie, Jordan Tice, and Paul Cowart. How did the camp go? Camp camp was camp was amazing, and I, mean, I guess I should start with I kind of built the camp for me. I'm fascinated with the band Hawktail, and as we'll get into, I I run a handful of camps, and I kind of started them for me because I want to be around banjo players, and and I love this band Hawktail and those individual musicians. But it ended up other people were interested in the camp as well. We had almost a hundred people from twelve different countries. And you had some special guests. So Hawktail interviewed bass icon Edgar Meyer. And then you had, piping in from Sweden, I assume, the Vesson duo. The Vesson duo. Who, and they're adorable. And I mean, no disrespect in that way. But they've been doing a lot of, uh, from what I gather, they've been doing some live streams on Facebook during the pandemic. And they're there, like, th- they were incredible. Their English is flawless. And they're telling these lengthy stories. And um, Olaf played, like, octave nickel harpa which i'd never seen like uh, tuned an octave down and i mean it's so hot they're so in love with their own sound in a beautiful way like it's so slow and haunting and uh so that was great hocktail right before pa- paul cohort is the bass player in hocktail and is plays in a very similar style to edgar meyer and so we were discussing uh, the camps that we've done before with my the camp, the Banjo Summit and Modern Mandolin. For Banjo Summit, we got Bela Fleck was kind of the special guest. And for Modern Mandolin, we got Mike Marshall. Fortunately, everybody's home with pandemic. So Paul mentioned Edgar Meyer. I had not even thought of asking, but Paul said, yeah, maybe we can. And so the four of them went over to Edgar's house into his studio and sat down and recorded a 90 minute interview um, of just them asking him questions mostly about his his career it was less um and just i mean they spent a whole bunch of time on one of my favorite albums of all time which was uncommon ritual and uh on strength and numbers and he described writing for uh hillary hahn he wrote a fiddle concerto or not fiddle but violin concerto for her and um, it was it was edgar was incredible he was so forthcoming and wonderful and funny and it's so cool that edgar got involved and i can't imagine any other I can't imagine Edgar being as forthcoming with anyone else as he might be with Paul, because Paul studied with him at Curtis, and they have a long history of like a direct friendship, mentorship, and being in Edgar's house in his studio, I imagine that things came up that might not have come up, and they asked, would have asked questions that would not have come up like if Terry Gross had interviewed him, True. per se. My understanding, in, you know, in talking with Paul, um, in some ways, Edgar doesn't care about some, some of this stuff. I went to, I was explaining who Edgar Meyer was to a friend of mine and sent him a, from his Wikipedia page. He's in shorts and a t-shirt. The photo of him on his wiki page, Wikipedia page is him in shorts and a t-shirt standing up like at an outdoor stage in Telluride. It's so you know, the, one of the greatest living double bass players of all time. But yeah, so he likes the fact that it was kind of private and behind a paywall was was of interest to him. But I did search up an interview with him that's on YouTube that you could find where people, it's the most rudimentary questions you could imagine. Like, 
what is the base? And you think like, how is anybody going to make this an interesting answer? And and, and and Edgar gave incredible answers. I highly recommend looking this interview up. Like, it's a compelling what, 10, 15 minutes, however, however long it is. So could someone after the fact still sign up and like view it as an archived thing? Or is that? Yes, that that is the plan. It's um, it's kind of a one man operation here at Round Window Institute. So these camps that I run are run by a nonprofit called the Round Window Institute and the Round Window being the banjo kind of view out into the musical world to like hocktail and various things. It is now all up in an archive. Everything was recorded, all the kind of Zoom lessons of what hawk and so hocktail broke down all of their tunes. Um, they had a session that was just plectrum. So it was Dominic and Jordan discussing the role of mandolin and guitar in Hocktail. And then Brittany and Paul discussing bows. They talked about harmony and key centers and rhythm and groove and then broke down their pieces. And every piece is is so detailed, like in a way that we can when you listen to it, you know, there's a lot of detail in it. And then you hear them talk about it and you realize whoa, there's five more levels of detail. And then you would hear Paul talk about it. And even during some of the sessions, they're listening to Paul describe some hemiolas in the tune on Bjorn. And the band is just kind of looking at him like, whoa, you hear all that too? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, just incredible. And the other reason I wanted to do it came from the mandolin. Dominic Leslie taught at the mandolin camp that it's called Modern Mandolin Workshop. And, uh, that I ran in November and I requested him to do, since these camps are for me, I don't do this with every faculty, but I'm like, I want you to do the music of Hocktail. And Dominic broke down a couple of the tunes and I just realized like, I had no idea, like they'll play through, they'll play through, they, he broke down the tobogganist and Dominic never does this every time, every A, 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 B, B, he's doing something different. Sometimes he's only playing two strings. Sometimes he's laying out. Sometimes he's playing the melody. Sometimes he's just playing chords. Like it's completely scripted, so to speak. And it never feels stiff or scripted in that way, but because they're beautiful players. But um, I just, I didn't really realize like how detailed it was. And the camp was a, uh, a chance to kind of unpack that and they delivered in spades. I mean, Paul is just, he's, he's incredible and they're, they're all incredible. to your question was uh, the plan is to um, I haven't quite figured out a pricing scheme to what's fair for people who paid full like you know to kind of access the archive after the fact is maybe not quite as valuable as in, as doing it live but it's not quite fair to the people who paid full tuition just a couple weeks ago at some point that will be you could just get in touch and I can I can let you know when it goes to the public Awesome. Well, you've got another camp coming up. And am I right that Banjo Summit was the first camp that you put on? Correct. Banjo Summit is our like flagship camp, so to speak. And we're about to run the sixth Banjo Summit. You alluded to this. You wanted a camp that you, as a professional musician who's like played tiny desk concerts and put out albums, like you're, you're a high level musician. You wanted a camp that you would get a lot out of. Tell me what pieces came together for the first Banjo Summit. And then of course, give us the full pitch. Like Banjo Summit number six is gonna be in February with Noam Pakelny and all these incredible artists. Let's get to what the new one's gonna be. But where did it start? And then what's the new one gonna be? Like anything, there were several elements floating around, but I mean, I've been you know a, a previous guest on Relax Your Grid it is Jamie Stone. And Jamie Stone and I have been friends for, for a long, long time. We met in the late nineties at the Maryland Banjo Academy. Um, this incredible event that was put on by Banjo Newsletter, um, where there were 50 faculty, 25 old time, 25 three finger style. And Jamie was like a young kid at that point. I was younger, but not as young as Jamie. Um, and and we kind of hit it off. He had just been studying with Tony Trishka. He was, and uh, we just hit it. And he's, you know, he was really in his kind of more avant-garde Toronto downtown jazz time in his life. And so we, 
hit it off and connected. And he would always bring in all these kind of, I, it wasn't lessons, but I would just learn so much from him. And he has been very inspirational to me. Like Jamie likes taking lessons. And I really admire that about Jamie. And I also know in other realms, in other, or I shouldn't say other realms, but in many other styles of music, I mean, it's common to take lessons in classical music all the way through your career and in jazz and um and I, it's for some reason, folk music, as soon as you kind of can play well enough and get on stage, you don't take as many lessons. Some people do. It's not that it's not, but it's not as public. It's not as public facing as it would be. Nobody would think less of you as a jazz musician. If you're like, I'm doing this great workshop this weekend. I'm going to go be a student. That's, and um, so it's not viewed the same way. And so part of the, like, I don't want to say our mission statement, but I certainly want to create an opportunity where professional musicians can show up and learn at these camps and are welcome. And um, I was also inspired by Mike Block, who spent, who graduated from Juilliard and um, then went to all these camps as a student. And, and so <laughs> those are a couple of people. And I also took my child to Valley of the Moon and see our fiddle camp, some of the Alistair Frazier fiddle camps where Mike Block shows up as a student for, you know, just to bring Mike up again. But I mean, other people who are incredible full-time professional musicians that take time out of their year to go spend a week learning tunes and in the woods. And um, so those were kind of circling around for me, you know, and I wanted something like that for banjo. I talked with the person who did the, um, the guy's name is Rufo, who did um, the mandolin symposium. He's like, you should do something like this for banjo and just realized nobody was going to do it unless I did it. And um, about maybe four years ago, I was teaching at Kaufman Camp, and which is a great camp, you know, run by Steve Kaufman. It's this huge camp. And I was part of this panel and um, we were each asked to play. It was myself and Don Sternberg and um, who else? Ned Luberecki, like a handful of people up. And we were each asked to play something. Josh Goforth was there and, and uh, they were asking me to play something. I was like, oh, I'll play this Shoro tune like that I kind of had ready to go, like a little more classical-ish, a Brazilian Shoro tune called Chorando by Chino. So I, pl I played the A part, I think, you know, it felt, it felt a little excessive to play all, you know, the whole three and a half minutes. So I played the A part and this guy next to me, <laughs> I can't remember his name, a kind of guitarist from the South, he's like, son, that didn't have a forward roll in the whole thing. And it was literally, you know, I'm thinking to myself, like, how do I answer this? Like, well, I've, um, I'm not going to pronounce, you know, the composer of this piece from 1920 composed it on clarinet. So, of course, it doesn't have any forward rolls in it. I didn't know how to, so I just played the melody. Um, so, but it was literally like that moment of like, I need to do this. Like, people's people think like that the banjo is forward roll and nothing against the forward roll. And it is hard to play a great forward roll like J.D. Crow, rest in peace. Like there is a true incredible art to that. And, and it's an important part of it. But then there's all this other music that people are hearing on the banjo when you see Punch Brothers or the Flectones or, you know, I mean, all over. Like they hear all this music and it's being applied and performed. But um, there was very few places where that the, the level the people who are studying that and playing that and working on it and performing it all gathered as faculty often like people like myself i at kaufman camp i was the kind of one like out of the like the kind of left field guy where it's like oh we have the trad people and the people who teach at every camp it's like oh let's try and see this but it's like why not get all of those people together at once at one camp and so that was the impetus for the original banjo summit maybe four ish years ago i've lost track we this is the sixth but it has not been it's been a little erratic mainly because of the pandemic like sometimes every six months sometimes every you know every year so i had the good fortune and it was actually it was jamie stone who connected us so you and i met years ago i think was it folk alliance you 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 are i know you had your album expedition is that right that sounds right yeah we met you were super friendly you, you gave me a copy of your record. You, this is years and years and years ago when I was like trying to tour as an old time musician. 
thinking I could be the next Bruce Molsky. I was like, well, there's only one Bruce Molsky. Let him do it. He's really good at it. Um, but then you and I, I don't know that we saw each other much. And then I moved to Colorado and I was helping Jamie with some things. Oh, uh, regarding his Compose Your Career course that has now launched. Um, and then he texted me and said, hey, Jake Sheps might need someone to take some photos at his banjo summit in Fort Collins. Like, are you around? And I leapt at the chance and I was blown away, Jake. Like this was, I guess, fall, maybe December. No, November 2019. Does that sound right? The last in-person one. Tony Trishka was there, right? Exactly. So you had Tony Trishka, you know, the godfather of left field banjo and Adam Larrabee, Jamie Stone, yourself, and B.B. Bownis was there for at least part of it. Courtney Hartman was the resident guitar player. You took over the music district here in Fort Collins, where I'm calling you from. And I would go from room to room and take photos for Instagram. And it was extraordinary what was going on. Like, yes, there were great stories about Earl Scruggs. And there were great stories in the same day about Bela Fleck. And then Tony Trishka talking about producing Paul McCartney for a Steve Martin album. Like, you know, things that these banjo players get into whether it's Jamie Stone's deciphering of what Bela can do or Tony getting to work with one of the Beatles or you talking about Brazilian music or Adam talking about composing these preludes. Like I grew up going to banjo events like the Tennessee Banjo Institute where you get, you know, my dad, lifelong banjo nerd, and you get people nerding out about the instrument itself and its origins and classic banjo style. And it's a lot of backward looking um important, important work. But to then walk into a room in 2019 and have Jamie Stone, like having people learn Indian classical music rhythm syllables to say out loud, and then hear these stories about Bela Fleck or Paul McCartney, and then Adam playing these new works on like, it was, it's a really great event. And I could see that students of a variety of levels were getting a ton out of it. Everyone was, was having a good time. And it seems like the kind of event that a person could go to for the rest of their life. I mean, of note, I guess a couple things. One of the, fav- I would say the most popular of thing that happened at that Banjo Summit was Courtney. We did a round robin where people would spend like 20 minutes, 15 or 30 minutes, I can't remember the t- 20 minutes in different rooms where you work on odd meters with Jamie. And then you go in and one of the most popular things was Courtney did one on playing free, just free improvising. And she would have people like, kind of trade around ideas or all play together and add in. And it's not something you see at folk music camps, where at jazz camps, they play free all the time. But nobody has really, not that you need to teach a lot about it, but you just need to do it. And um, and having it coached in that way, and people, and Courtney is obviously just a wonderful human being. And, and um, yeah, that was one of the more popular parts of it. And I think that's the idea is that you can go to, go to this forever. Um, I had been marketing it prior to the pandemic. I'd been marketing it kind of as an intermediate and up. You know, these levels are so, I feel like an intermediate in so many ways. While I'm a professional musician and I can digest complicated music, I also feel like there are so many things I can't do. And I feel in an intermediate in many realms. But um for the pandemic, I kind of sent out the evaluation after our first Banjo Summit. I just said, okay, anybody can come. Just know this is not a how to, pl- there's no how to play the banjo. There's no fundamental technique. Here's how you put your picks on. And I pulled kind of a hint and inquired from them and everybody loved it. Like it's so inspirational. So if you can't understand most of what's going on, you're still getting little tidbits and ideas of how to practice and just general inspiration of like, that's possible. I don't, ha- I don't, if you don't like J.D. Crow and listening to that music, you can spend your time learning Vesson tunes. It's great. Like, I mean, it just, it, it's very kind of eye-opening. And so I've had very few people who've complained like that was all over my head. And now I feel like crap. It's been mostly inspirational. Plus, I mean, the faculty that has come has been so wonderful too. That's a good point. Like I, as a teacher and as a eternal student, I took a, I took a lesson this uh, this week on Monday morning with the percussive dancer, Nick Garris. When I was teaching at the Old Town School, I could get discounted lessons in group classes. And I, as much as I could have time for, I would try and be in a class, like slide, guitar, slide blues guitar or singing lessons or like all this stuff. 
I think it's so important that you are just putting a stake in the ground and saying, look, we all have, if we want it, we have the opportunity to keep learning and keep growing and from each other. And it's not just like, like you said, like, oh, I got my first gig. I don't have to take another lesson again. Because in other genres, they know very well that as you keep growing, it helps to then check in with a mentor and just, and, and or even just a peer. But sometimes those happen at these kind of events that, you know, between classes, you might talk to someone and this light bulb goes out or like to two previous guests of the show, like the reason Jamie Stone produced Max Allard's album is because of that banjo summit that I went to, like them meeting there with Max as a student and Jamie as a teacher, like that planted the seed that became Max's debut album, um, which by the time this airs will be will be out in the world. Having heard it, it's gorgeous. So it's it's beautiful. It's, it's really beautiful. All right, I'm ready for it. Tell us what the what Banjo Summit number six, the one that's going to happen in February. What's it going to who's going to be there and and why should everyone sign up from all corners of the globe? So the faculty includes uh, hopefully I don't forget anybody, but it's um, Noam Pekilney will be there. B.B. Bowness, Kristen Scott Benson, Bill Evans, Wes Corbett, Jamie Stone, Adam Larrabee, Joe Troop. And um, Joe, just while we're speaking, Joe is going to play a concert. We also have kind of evening concerts. Um, Joe's going to play a concert and then describe some of the music that's off his new spectacular record. And um, Kaya Cater is going to play a concert as well as John Bullard is going to do a thing on the Adam Larrabee preludes. Those are the concerts, the others, the faculty. It's February 11th, 12th, and 13th. We do it from noon till 9 p.m. East Coast time. So hopefully that hits people. Um, it, Europeans can kind of access most of it. It's not too ridiculously early for the West Coasters. And, uh, and once again, it all gets recorded and posted into an archive. So if you can't make it all real time. We, we do what we call office hours before each day. And that is a chance, partly for Europeans because they can't stay up late, but that's a, it's a little more focused on asking questions about the content and it ends up being more kind of Q and a between it's just an open zoom meeting. So a giant zoom meeting of 40 people are there. It's big, but um, that's office hours. And then after hours happens every evening, it starts at nine after that final concert and then goes till whenever that's also just kind of an open forum, but it ends up being a little more like, Hey, play me something. And you play and talk about, Stuff, like it's a little more late night hang. And uh, in between, the part, the kind of main show is on Zoom webinar. So it's not like your typical, like it looks like regular Zoom, but you're not allowed, to, you're not, not allowed, partly not allowed, but also you're not able to turn on your own camera. And so you're, you can sit there, you can get, you don't have to wear clothes if you don't want to. You can get up and leave. You can show up and not show up. Nobody is like, oh, why they look so bored. So teaching wise, it's a little awkward because you're not getting that feedback of like, is anybody there? It's just seeing yourself in the screen. And uh, so it feels a little like you're talking into a vacuum and you can see on the participant count, there's 76 people there. But it, it allows the students, you can noodle along as loud as you want, or you could play something from the last class. It's And then, so all of that's happening. And then everything gets recorded and posted in the archive and master musician, he's my just musical hero in countless ways, Adam Larrabee. Um, he's, he goes and transcribe, him and I kind of together and sometimes some of the artists, but go and transcribe a bunch of what was laid down during the summit. So the archive ends up becoming a little more of a, a living document and students have submitted tabs too. be like, oh, I really like this. Bela played six courses of Bill Cheatham. And, you know, other faculty show, like Ben Krakauer, who was on faculty at some point, he transcribed like all six courses of Bill Cheatham from that thing. And so that, that gets posted inside the archive. And so it ends up being like, it doesn't just end on February 13th, 
but here's this stuff and then here's more and more information that you can get. Adam has been a big driver of that. Like he, he's, he's helped me kind of conceptualize it in so many ways. And, um, and he is just a monster transcriber. Like I can't even, I can't even explain what a, just the phenomenal, incredible musician he is. I'm sold, uh, <laughs> 250 bucks folks. And, and, and this is all yours. And you, do you have some scholarships available? Do I remember? I do. I've been, um, like if you, if you need a scholarship, just kind of click the box and we can, there's a little box that says if you need, um, and right now, actually from a generous grant from the, um, Schultz family foundation, anyone 18 and under is free. That's huge. Several of my students took the hocktail camp, and I've seen one of them for their lesson. Vessen was the highlight because they they didn't even know about Vessen. Like you know, they're Americans, and they hadn't encountered Vessen as a trio or a duo. Um, but others I haven't seen yet. But I got some texts and some emails about how wonderful that camp was. And I think I, I think Adam is right to to help you move in this direction because you're you're turning Banjo Summit in particular and maybe all of the camps, into a community. It's not just like a one-off, like, two days, and then you never see or think about that stuff again or those people again. If it's a living library and if there's a way for people to keep interacting with the content and even with each other, you're, it sounds like you're developing a sustainable um, way for, the, for all the left fielders, to use your, your image from earlier, to, to know where they, they feel at home and who they can check in with and where to get inspiration. It's like, oh, what was that fifth fifth chorus that Bela blew on uh on Bill Cheatham or whatever like um that's amazing Jake do you have even grander visions beyond these three camps like is your goal to, to be running x number of camps and and or or have you hit the point where you feel like you've got you've got the mandolin the modern mandolin thing this progressive banjo thing a band camp with hocktail uh well uh, hocktail camp may not happen again it was kind of conceived of and run as a one-off. And I'm not sure if we ran another one next January. I mean, they do have a new record coming out, but whether they have that much more material to cover. Actually, let me let me back up and say they have, there's, I, I could sit and listen to Hocktail talk about their music for another two days, e gladly and easily. But it was kind of conceived of as a whole of like, this is a one-off, um, and maybe not to be repeated in that exact form. We've loosely talked about doing another Modern Mandolin workshop. There's no dates on the books. What's kind of nice about the online, I mean, part of it is this pandemic of like, well, what's happening? Can we all meet up? But uh, the musical directors for that were Casey Campbell and David Benedict. They helped me kind of keep it more mandolin focused since I'm not very good on, I can't play mandolin at all. So we've kind of loosely talked about it, but that's just gone to sleep, at least for now, probably until summer. Um, and so, yeah, and I'm more closely connected banjo with the banjo world. The board of directors of Round Window Institute is all banjo players at this point. Um, Mike Witcher approached me about running something related to Dobro, which I think has potential. Um, but as of like right now, I'm just trying to get like, I don't have much time for Banjo Summit. By the time you hear this, it'll be 10 days away. I'm kind of consumed with that. And then the other thing that the Round Window Institute is going to do is start publishing banjo transcription books. Uh, they, there was a company that went called AccuTab. I think AccuTab maybe stopped publishing a decade ago or so, run by John Lawless of, of bluegrasstoday.com. Uh, and so we are hard at work, hopefully by the time Banjo Summit this Banjo Summit happens, we'll have released our first book, which is a transcription book of Wes Corbett's album Cascade. Everything that Wes plays, all of the melodies and all of his solos, and then a handful of selected backup and all just kind of, it's not all his right hand and left hand fingerings, but it's um, everywhere that you, that are unintuitive. And Wes Corbett is, he's currently the banjo player with Sam Bush Band. He's one of my favorite musicians in the world. 
favorite banjo players. He's just extraordinary in every sense of the word. The album is beautiful. And I know lots of albums kind of cry, like music has become a little like a Twitter feed, like, oh, here's something new. And you just move on and forget about it. But I would highly recommend going back and spending some time with Wes's, Wes's album Cascade, which came out in um, maybe a year and a half ago. And um, so that that is going to be coming out. And Adam, Adam and I have been working on that together with Wes quite a bit on that. The next few books that are planned, Adam Larrabee has a prelude project, which I mentioned that's going to be a concert that John Bullard, a very, he's a legend, a legend in the banjo community and maybe outside too, but for always playing classical music. He commissioned Adam to write 24 preludes, like short musical pieces in all major and minor keys, all in G tuning, which as far as we know has never been done. Um, it's always hard to say whether somebody might have done something like this and lives in a music library and, you know, at the University of California at Santa Cruz, like who knows? But um, it not, you know, nobody we've talked to has encountered a recording like of this nature. And uh, so John is about to release, by the time you hear this, I think um, the end of book two will be released. So there'll be 12 that are out. And... Um, they're these incredible, beautiful kind of holistic pieces. There's some on YouTube if you search them up. Um, they kind of stand alone as solo banjo pieces. And so we'll be publishing Adam's Preludes. Bela Flex, My Bluegrass Heart book is also on the, uh, um, is it's kind of all been put into Sibelius and transcribed, but we're still, we're hoping to get that out by the time Bela Flex camp happens in August. He runs the Blue Ridge Banjo Camp. So that's the timeline for that. Uh, and Max Allard, um, currently he is a student at Oberlin and his January project is to transcribe his own record and put it all into Sibelius. But Max is, I mean, you've heard some of that, I think on this podcast, I mean, his playing is just exquisite and the pieces are like nothing else that are out there that also really stand alone as these solo banjo pieces. And so, um, plan is to do a Max Allard book as well. Um, what the timeline is for all these books I mean, it's, it is a mom and pop operation or really just a pop operation <laughs> being just, it's not completely me. I mean, I have a board of directors and collaborators with these, but um, we're figuring it out organically. It's not like we're coming at it like Mel Bay or um, in that direction. And so we'll, we'll see, it, stay in touch and kind of get on my email list and we'll let you know when those books come out. Yeah, so that was actually going to be my question. How should people get in the know, like join the Banjo Summit email list um, or go to Round Window Institute? Do you have a standalone presence for that? Banjosummit.org is probably is the main, at this point, the main, you know, and just I think there's a, there is an, there's a place to sign up for my email list there. The other thing you can do to get on my email list is I have, um, is you can send an email to 321 banjo at gmail nice <laughs> this was a trick i learned from um clay ross who's part of the compose your career that you mentioned he would do this from stage to get people and it, that wasn't his i don't know what his email address but he's he told everybody in the audience like pull out your smartphone and send me an email right now and then you'll get a free track you know he there was kind of some auto responder and I, I don't think there's a free track anymore but i can let you know when the books come out so 321 banjo at gmail because you're likely listening to this on your phone right now amazing amazing i um with your encouragement i just bought sibelius and i've got my first the podcast listeners can't see this but i'm showing jake on the screen i got my first well, draft two of my first three sibelius generated two finger banjo tabs to share with my patreon folks um for the january tab dump but yeah i i'm super inspired by round window institute with you at the helm becoming the new source for progressive banjo not just information but like that you're gonna be where people go like when bela has a big banjo project or max or jamie or adam like all the all the all the cats you're involved with you've already got in the queue wes obviously um what one thing that's kind of interesting that adam has really adam is yeah i i keep talking about adam but he is incredible but he's 
he's very literary about music. Like he's a great, like he's also an incredible, he's an incredible banjo player, but an incredible jazz guitarist. And he's the guitar chair at James Madison University. Like, I mean, he has a fully legit, heavy jazz side to him, but he has tons of books. And so he's very aware of like what the canon is related to guitar primarily and some banjo. And he, so he, and you know, with Bela Fleck, for example, is a great example. I mean, Bela Fleck is such an important musician, even if you don't play banjo. I mean, he's a he's a huge hero and mentor for tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of musicians, but certainly with, within banjo, and he's essentially undocumented. You look at how much stuff has been done, like how much stuff out there related to somebody like Pat Metheny or Bill Frizzell, like there's quite a bit of literature kind of documenting them. Bela has done some things. There's a few older books that are now out of print and they're they're not great. Like they could all be redone and hopefully. Yeah, I have a, I have a Flecktones book that I got as a teen, like when Bela Fleck was my teenage hero and, I, and, and the Flecktones were the thing he was touring. I have a Flecktones book, but it's kind of just like one of those things you'd get at Guitar Center for like. It's all notation. It's not even. Yeah, standard musical notation. It's not banjo centered. It's just kind of like, here's the melody to Sinister Minister, but like you'd play it on a piano or something. Yeah. And so, I mean, it's like, it's, yeah, I suddenly realized like, oh, but he makes, like you can figure out the notes, but how he plays these things, some are intuitive and some are decidedly not. And, um, but, you know, that, that in and of itself could be somebody's full time job is just documenting. Documented Bela Fleck. There's a lot of stuff to go backwards. There's probably more coming out. I know he has albums in the can that none of us have heard, like a new record with Zakir Hussain, Edgar Meyer, and they added a flute player. This album's in the can with no specific release date, just because well, My Bluegrass Heart is the... That's what's happening right now. To put you on the spot, and you can give me a, a coy answer if you want, but would you want to, down the line put out a book of all of Bela's parts from drive or well, like one of his like iconic older albums, or are you thinking just like current albums and, and the future? Like what, what feels like, does anything feel off limits for you? I would be very interested in redoing the drive book. If anybody has seen the drive book, it's a very primitive t- um, typesetting of, of tablature that could be with a handful of mistakes. It's mostly accurate, but I think you could, we could do far better than what it was. I think Bela tabbed it out himself in like the late 80s in the back of the Newgrass Revival bus. So on some very primitive like dot matrix style printer. Um, so d- redoing the drive book would be great. I think doing tr- standard notation charts for drive since those have all become standards, like almost every tune on the album is a standard in the campground. Um, the His classical record, he has... I mean, he's told me he has boxes. It's all, it was all tabbed out. And it's, he's just like, it's in a box somewhere here. Um, so um, he put out the Tales of the Acoustic Planet, volume one and volume two, both have tablature books. Those three, the drive, um, those three were on, were put out by uh, Homespun. And while Homespun still exists, Bela may have gotten the rights back. I don't want to get out in front of my skis on this so i don't i mean there's been talk of that so i think going backwards would be great there's there's so much i think doing stuff with his concertos um like the cadet like it's all the cadenzas the kind of solo sections that's another thing that bela has in the can is a third concerto um and the cadenzas would be really neat to have in tablature i i mean we just have to wait and see he's a busy man as we all know and that's we all get to take that in but uh um he's kind of hard it's the pandemic it was a little easier to pin him down than than, than it is right now now that he's now that he's playing carnegie hall exactly. uh, for example he's a little busier i would love for y'all to put out a book of perpetual motion tabs uh, bela's classical album that was that was a really as a longtime fan of bela's music when he came out with that with the picture of him you know, like unbuttoned tux, you know, with his banjo. <laughs> um, and then all those collaborations with different instrumentation. That's just a gorgeous, gorgeous record. And I I know that banjo students, like the next Max Allard, would want that book. Because um, I know the current one would. <laughs> and 
I would want it just to just to try my hand at it in the privacy of my own home as an old time banjo player. I would I would want to try some of that stuff. Um, so here's a vote for for perpetual motion as a round window institute publication. I you know I I hope. I hope the relationship will continue and that I could really dive into his catalog because there's so much there, both backwards and forwards, that um that should that should get out there. And I think at some point I mean, who knows if Bela will ever slow down. But I do I do know his like these sorts of things are important to him. Yeah, and and bringing it back to his camp, you know, he is now running this camp when the pandemic isn't canceling it for banjo players in North Carolina to meet up and he oversees it. And then he has people like Kristen Scott Benson and always an incredible faculty as you have at the Banjo Summit. It makes sense that my bluegrass heart would be on the merch table at his camp um, this summer. Like that, that just makes not just talking about like the commodity of it, like, Oh, like he can make a couple extra bucks out of it. But if someone's going to Bayless camp, they're going to buy that book if it's there and you're doing us a big service by putting that book out into the world. Um, because My Bluegrass Heart is, it's a seminal album already. And you and I have had fun text conversations about this Punch Brothers album or that Bela thing, you know, as we geek out about it. But there's no denying, like, this is an important record. And it's it, it's important not just because they just played the Ryman in Carnegie Hall. It's going to be an album that people reference for decades to come. And I should note, we sat next, next to each other during the premiere of it at Rocky Grass last summer. And we're able to like, <laughs> I will never forget that. Yeah, I got to see I got to hear this music for the first time um, and check in with you every 20 seconds, like with our jaws dropping. And you had heard some of the tracks prior, but not all. I hadn't heard them all. I had heard about half the album at that point. So that was extraordinary. And I wish Rocky Grass gave out an M- MVP trophy because it would have gone to Justin Moses for playing every duet part possible while also slaying on the dobro while jerry douglas was sitting you know 20 yards in front of him just like hanging out and having a ball (laughs) um so any dobro player who can play on stage with bela while flux is just there chilling um should should be you know lauded as one of the dobro players of the century playing double banjo with ba- double banjo Bela. with Bela, double fiddle with Michael Cleveland, double mandolin with with his wife Sierra Hall, and then and then just like the best dobro you'd ever want from anyone not named Jerry Douglas. Here's here's a quick aside from that Rocky Grass stage when Jimmy Martin came to play. He was came and he was drunk on stage. This was quite a while ago. I mean, you know, in the early mid nineties. Um, it's like hello Colorado, like it's this legendary set that he did and. His do- and his dobro player, every single solo, Jerry or Jimmy Martin would lean forward into the microphone. Jerry Douglas was sitting up in the front, like in the front row. <laughs> Jimmy Martin would say before he kicked into his solo, "It's like, look out, Jerry Douglas in the audience." Every time, I mean, the poor guy <laughs> was self-conscious, anyways, and to have himself like he could never forget it. Bela's not Jimmy Martin. He did not do that to Justin <laughs> even once. Well, Jake, it has been such a pleasure to talk with you. Um, I always love our conversations. I'm, I'm really enjoying getting to know you better uh, this past year through music, um, past couple of years, actually, going back to the summit. Um, you've put out three v- totally fascinating albums of, of your music and, well, your arrangements and your original music. How about you... How about you pick something from either Entwined or An Evening in the Village or 10,000 Leaves to be the full track? I'm just going to put you on the spot. What what should I play folks out so they they can hear a full track of of Jake Shep's from one of those three albums that I just mentioned? What should folks enjoy as we go out? That's right. I forgot that I actually make music too, besides just <laughs> running camps. Given Because of the pandemic, it just has not been as performance driven the last um, 
couple of years. And uh, so, yeah, each one of those is quite different. The 10,000 Leaves is mostly original music. And then the idea about, I did a record of all music by Bela Bartok. And the kind of seed for that it was the, like, how does a classically trained composer treat folk music? And so as a folk musician, like, what can I learn from Bartok, who's this, he was an extraordinary composer and had this heavy influence on people like Chikoria and Jazz World and string quartets are incredible. Like, how would he treat Blackberry Blossom, which he never played, but he did other tunes not unlike that. And so, um, and I, so I arranged a bunch of that music for string band. You can, we did a tiny desk concert. You can find that online. And then the most recent kind of pressed album that we did, that I did, was I, um, the next kind of, in my own mind, the next step was like, well, what would Bartok do to folk music? The next step was what would living composers do with the five piece string band? And so I contacted four different composers. One was not a classically trained composer. It was Matt Flinner was kind of the inside, inside guy, but a composer named Matt McBain, Mark Mellitz and Gian Riley. And, uh, they each wrote for, for, um, banjo, mandolin, fiddle, guitar and bass. And so we did a big record of that. It was a, it was a huge project. I would say something from that kind of my favorite track. That's, it's a little, it's, I do think it needs a little setup for, to, because it's somewhat obtuse. And since we've talked about really challenging music, um, this whole time, the title track from entwined is, I think it's the third movement of, um, the Matt McBain piece called drawn and it's an additive piece. And so each musician plays like adds one note at a time. And so it starts with like, you know, I would come in with one note on measure 29 is like, you'll eventually, and then I come in and then it goes through the whole cycle and then I would play two notes, you know, on measure 35. I can't remember exactly, but you know, and then that adds up to a groove. All of us add up to this groove and then it kind of deconstructs and we start this other groove one note at a time where you don't really know like what is this other groove that's actually pretty funky until the bass comes in at some point and then and then that deconstructs and goes to the original groove so that's kind of what entwined was and it was so outside of anything outside of my musical world and um like a lot of that music we ended up making sounds like that you don't really hear in string band music and um it was a tall, like I still have just feel so much immense gratitude to all those musicians that I worked with on that to learn those pieces because, you know, we're folk musicians. Like it's super fun to sit in the campground and play without music stands and just and improvise and to ask all these folks to be look, reading, counting 29 measures before they play one note is, uh, is, a, <laughs> is different. And they all rose to the challenge and killed it. So that's... That's what I would suggest. That's a great suggestion. So that's what you're going to hear as we go out. Make sure to go to banjosummit.org to sign up for the summit, February 11th through 13th, if you get this in time, or just to sign up for all the great books of Tab that are coming out. Um, There's actually a beautiful documentary about the making of this album um, that I will include a link to in the show notes so that you can see Jake and the quintet interacting with some of the composers and playing some of the music, but Jake Sheps, thank you so much for being on relax your grid. Thank you so much for having me here. It's really an honor and a treat. And I love your podcast folks. Here's the Jake Sheps quintet playing entwined.
Relax Your Grid is produced, edited, and mixed by me, Matt Brown. Tim Brown provides post-production support. Otto Allard is the designer. Tune in next time for my conversation with IBMA Fiddle Player of the Year, Bronwyn Keith Hines. And until then, relax your grid. <laughs>